All right. Uh, at this time, if everybody would turn off their video and their uh, mute their microphones, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Miles Gilbert. He's our speaker. Uh, he'll be talking on the uses of birds by the ancient um, I can't, I can't. American Indians. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, turn this over to two miles and we will yep, start, start sharing on the screen excellent start sharing the screen here and let's see we're ready to go we're ready to ready go, to go. Well, except for me <laughs> good evening everyone first i'd like to thank the agave house chapter for inviting me to be here tonight, and I'd certainly like to thank Richard Gonsalves for getting all the technology put together. This is the first Zoom meeting that I have ever participated in. The title, as you see, is Uses of Birds by Native Americans, but the title of the book is Avian Osteology. Avian refers to birds. Osteology refers to identification and analysis of bones. So avian osteology has to do with the identification of bird bones. Virtually everything I'm going to say tonight is inside that book. My dear colleagues, Larry Martin and Howard Savage, both of whom have since passed away, leaving me the last man standing. We put this book together in 19, I think, 85, and uh, they are responsible for the osteology. They had students and they put together a, a number of really good means of identifying individual species of birds. I'm responsible for the uses of birds that uh, appear in the book. Uh, we will speak about the cover in a few moments. If you've ever skinned a bird, even a chicken or a duck, you know that they have very thin skins. This bag made from six feet of swans, not the feet of six swans, but the feet of three swans. So there's six swans feet there. And if you will notice how incredibly finely the feet are stitched together, think about how skillful was the man or woman who skinned out those swan's feet and then tanned them and uh, someone put them together then as a very useful bag. With regard to the uses of birds by archaeologists as well as by Indians, some birds are seasonally available and uh, some are very rigidly adapted to a micro environment. So when the archaeologists excavated Hogup Cave in Utah, they found that the people there had access to ducks and geese, which were available to them only when they migrated, mostly through the spring and then again through the fall. They also had access to sage grouse way out in the sage grouse prairies, and then they also hunted up in the spruce forest. So there were spruce grouse and sage grouse and <clears throat> ducks and geese there in Hogup Cave, giving us some idea of the range of environments that they were utilizing and the time of year that they were there. <clears throat> With regard to swans, the Hudson's Bay Company did a huge business in swan skins. In 1810, they shipped 1,833 swan skins. 2,576 in 1844, 2,453 in 1845, 1,922 in 1846. A gentleman named Samuel Hearn, writing in the 1770s, said some years ago the Indians killed those swans in such numbers that the down and quills might have been produced in considerable quantities at a trifling expense but since the depopulation of the natives by smallpox, no advantage can be made of those articles, though of considerable value in England. <clears throat> in 
It was also reported that the commercial importance of swan feathers stemmed from the use of down for powder puffs, the small feathers for dress trimmings, and the quills for pins. John James Audubon himself preferred swan quills to steel pins for the fine detail work in his drawings. In 1776, the standard of trade at York Factory on Hudson's Bay valued six swan's skins as equal to one beaver. What do I want? I'm looking, for, I'm looking for that. I beg your pardon. <clears throat> Gowns and shirts and parkas of bird skins have been preserved in many ethnological collections. 58 cormorant skins were sewn together in an Eskimo gown in the collection of the National Museum of Finland. And this uh, figure shows a hooded parka comprising 30 individual puffin skins. Here is a bag made from the skins of loons, again, showing very skillful skinning of the animal and tanning and then sewing together. Of course, a major use of birds by Native Americans was for uh, <clears throat> the pot for eating. About 200,000 dovekies are eaten annually by the Greenland Eskimos. An individual might uh, catch as many as 300 a day simply by sitting in the glacial scree and, and uh, swatting the birds out of the air with a long-handled net. Since Tonga was in the news last week, we also learned that the clan chiefs of Tonga netted pigeons out of the air with long-handled nets. A major food provision of virtually every archaeological site east of the 100th meridian includes the birds, uh, the bones of passenger pigeons. They had not been reported very far west of the Missouri River in South Dakota, and I was surprised to find them then in the refuse of Chicken Louie's Chinese restaurant in historic Deadwood. In fact, Chicken Louie was in business <clears throat> at the time that Bill Hickok was there, and he, you may recall, was killed in Deadwood in 1876. The Carolina parakeet uh, is a very colorful bird now extirpated from North America. Its distributional history has been increased through interdisciplinary efforts Paul Wilhelm, Duke of Württemberg from Germany, was visiting in Missouri in 1822, and he mentioned seeing them in great flocks and noticed that the Missouri natives killed them, shot them, and used them for fish bait. Carl Bodmer, a very talented Swiss artist, painted this Carolina parakeet in a Mandan earth lodge in 1833, you will notice it here. And then in this close-up, the, uh, the color and the shape of the beak indicates that it was indeed a Carolina par parakeet. So that was pretty far north of its known range. Another bird, which has been found archaeologically way north, in this case, 185 miles north of its current range, is the pileated woodpecker. I mentioned uh, Maximilian von Wied-Nuvied, who had employed Carl Bodmer as an illustrator for his trip in 1833. Maximilian reported seeing a Pileated woodpecker head and scalp affixed to a Mandan medicine pipe. And here we have such a pipe in the hands of uh, Pariska Rupa, the, the two ravens. Uh, alas, uh, this particular one does not have a pileated woodpecker attached to it. But if you can imagine the work that would go into tanning and decorating a buffalo robe, which was deemed to be of equal value to a pileated woodpecker scalp and beak. Regard uh, 
this illustration by Charlie Russell of a Plains Indian woman doing the backbreaking labor of scraping a hide, and then she would have to go to a lot of physical labor to get it tanned and then decorated. So the pileated woodpecker was very highly valued by the Plains Indians because they were not locally available. The roseate spoonbill is another bird which has been locally extirpated and yet shows up in archaeological sites in the southeast. It was found uh, with a Middle Mississippian period burial and also seen as a decorative motif on pottery. The snowy owl is a very rare visitor to the, the central plains. Only when the lemming population in Canada is way, way down do these birds bother to jump the border and come down into Nebraska, North and South Dakota, and so forth. One of my students found the bones of one in a Republican period site in northwestern Kansas. That site dated from around AD 1300. The bird is so rare in the Central Plains that Lots and lots of bird watchers, including myself, drove up to 400 miles one way to catch a glimpse of one at the Cheyenne Bottoms National Refuge in uh, western Kansas. I took a photograph of a snowy owl on a telephone pole, and of course that photograph was not nearly as evocative as is this one. A uh, snowy owl was reported in Los Angeles in 1927. One of the things that we have learned in studying bird bones is that these lovely bone tube necklaces that we see in so many photographs of Plains Indians from that period were not made from bird bones at all. These were made by uh, the Campbell brothers in Passaic, New Jersey, who acquired what were essentially throwaway bones, the foot bones from cattle, and they... Uh, boiled them, cleaned them, sawed them, and turned them on lathes in order to make these nice bone tube beads. <clears throat> Another use of bird bones, of course, was to make whistles. The one on the left is uh, a mallard duck from a middle Mississippian period site in Missouri. The one on the right, a snow goose whistle, uh, a sun dance whistle collected from the Shoshone by archaeologist Bill Malloy in the 1930s. It's in the collections at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, where I had access to it. And finding someone with an ear for music, I blew it. And that person said, oh, that is C sharp. Stop blowing that. It's a very, very shrill sound. And if you can imagine having your pectoral muscles uh, pierced and leaning back against the pole, trying to pull them out while you're in during a, a Sundance ceremony and blowing that all the time. Uh, not something I want to endure. <clears throat> Trumpeter swans are another bird uh, whose presence way, way, way east of their current range was indicated by finding them in an archeological site in Pennsylvania. Now, the two longest bones in the middle of this, the one, the long bone in the middle on the left, is a uh, is an ulna from a snow goose, and the one to the right of that is from a sandhill crane. Of course, they've been shortened somewhat from their original uh, live length, but uh, they've been turned into flutes. The other bones are all also bird bones. And uh, these are all from San Lazaro Pueblo over in New Mexico. Ira mentioned reading uh, Tony Hillerman's novel, The First Eagle. I invite you to read that sometime if you get a chance. The thing is, the Hopi still capture young eagles from the nests in the spring, and they take them home, they feed them, uh, keep them in a pen on a... On a um, Pueblo roof, and they virtually become pets. And then by the time the summer solstice Nemon ceremony comes along toward the uh, end of July, pardon me, June, 
June 21st, somewhere along in there. Then the animals are strangled and they're plucked and their feathers are utilized in many, many different uh, ceremonial and, uh, and dress usages. So this uh, photograph is from inside a kiva and you can see the shadow interacting with the ladder on the other side of the, of the building. So this, these are light bars passing through the kiva ladder. Now, this is labeled as a Lakota. Any of you who are well acquainted with the headdress of Plains Indians would say, no, 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 that's clearly a Pawnee. Uh, Alfred Jacob Miller got his Indians mixed up. I mean, he was out there in 1833, and he may not have drawn this until a decade later. But the fact of the matter is, looking at a bona fide a bona fide Pawnee would say, yeah, that, that's clearly a Pawnee headdress. But as we have looked into the ethnological literature, we find that, yes, there was a Pawnee band amongst the Lakota. So, no, Miller didn't get his Indians mixed up. He did a good job illustrating Plains Indians. Now, your mission for this evening is to memorize this photograph. In fact, if you have your, your uh, cell phone camera with you, why don't you very cleverly photograph this so you can refer to it in a few moments, because we're going to look at a slide of an individual who has a feather uh, with a red spot on it. We're going to look at a couple of guys who have a feather that is split down the middle. So you will be able to say, oh, yeah, the red spot means that uh, that individual killed an enemy and the split one means that the wearer was wounded many times. So these feathers uh, as modified by Native Americans are sort of like the number of chevrons you have on your sleeve or the number of uh, bits and pieces of, of uh, war memorabilia that you're wearing on your chest. We owe a great debt to all the early day photographers who went out. Unfortunately, this particular Indian uh, tribal designation was not indicated. But uh, here he is with a split feather indicating that he was wounded many times. So I'm going to guess that uh, because of this sort of beadwork decoration, he might be an Eastern Plains Indian, like a um, member of the Nakota speaking band of the people we call the Sioux. By the way, the, the Sioux, <laughs> Lakota, Nakota, or Dakota, came by the term Sioux because when the French trappers got to uh, the, the western part of Minnesota and asked the Ojibwe, who hated the guts of the people we call Sioux, they asked them, who are those people that live out on the prairie to the west of you? And the Ojibwean said, Nada Sioux, which meant little snakes. He didn't like them at all. Okay, a couple things about these handsome turkeys. Notice, first of all, they're just a little bit of bronze and the tail feathers, but they are mostly white at the tips. These three individuals have interbred with uh, more white feathered domestic turkeys. And so... Uh, Wild turkey feathers, we will show you momentarily. Let's see, what else do I want to say about these before I get too far along? Well, quite a lot. Even though they're highly perishable, uh, turkey feather garments have been found in dry archaeological sites. There's one in the uh, Heard Museum down in Phoenix a turkey feather blanket that dates from Pueblo three times, about A.D. 1050 to 1300. The long feather quills were split and wrapped around cordage to produce a very fluffy, warm blanket. A turkey may have been sacrificed and placed in the air vent of an abandoned structure like a kiva. The American Fur Company shipped turkey tail feathers from St. Louis 
all the way up to Fort McKenzie, Montana for the Indian trade. Uh, this is a turkey tarso metatarsus all, which was absolutely a cultural marker for the Eastern Hopewell. Every Hopewell site has turkey tarso metatarsal alls in them. Here's a lovely drawing of a Fox Society dancer with magpie feathers. And if you look at the tips of these feathers, you will see that they're bronze rather than being white. And these feathers may have been obtained by trade from St. Louis, Missouri. Turkeys, of course, were served as a food item for virtually everybody. Even the Maya had them as early as, uh, and now these, I'm talking about Mexican turkeys, which originated in the Valley of Mexico and got traded all the way south down into Guatemala and uh, other areas where there were Maya. So the upper image shows a, a chap holding a turkey that had been beheaded and plucked uh, virtually everything but some wing feathers. And uh, then there is a captive turkey here. And this may indicate a turkey that is nesting and uh, producing eggs. Parrots were also important to the Maya, as well as Puebloans up here in Arizona, New Mexico, and so forth. Here's a, pirate, a Maya parrot glyph. It's very, very rare to find a military macaw in an archeological site in the Southwest. In fact, they are outnumbered 101 to one by scarlet macaws. To mention some sites that many of you would be acquainted with, Wupatki, north of Flagstaff, contained the remains of 41 scarlet macaws. Pueblo Manito in New Mexico had 30. 14 of those were in the floor of room 38. And uh, closer to home, Grasshopper Pueblo had 15 scarlet macaws. They were utilized by the Hopi and, and other, other Puebloans for the uh, spring equinox ceremony uh, when they were sacrificed. Probably they all came from, well, at least 200 miles south of any of those sites I've mentioned. Uh, there was uh, an aviary for them at uh, Casas Grandes. Uh, what's the name of it? Pocky May, is that the other name for Casas Grandes? I'm not sure. Well, I think it's Pocky May, but anyway, <coughs> Casas Grandes in, in Mexico. Those people uh, actually had uh, uh, macaw pens there and raised the, the birds and then traded them up to the north, at least for turquoise. We know that from Pueblo Benito, lots of turquoise and perhaps jet from there traded south for scarlet macaws. I didn't mention Eldon Pueblo. I don't many don't know how many others were found there, but when I was going through the animal remains from Eldon Pueblo, I did find the uh, Scarlet Macaw remains. Okay, I want to recognize Richard for the work he's done on improving the cover of avian osteology. This is what the uh, the shield looked like as recovered by the uh, American Museum of Natural History. This shield belonged to a Crow leader named Arapuish, which translates as rotten belly. And in 1832, he was ambushed by the Gros Vent up in Montana. Uh, the story was that if he was thinking about going out and stealing horses from the Lakota or the Blackfeet or somebody, he would take this shield and roll it down the hill, and if it landed face up, he would go steal horses. If it landed stay face down, he'd stay home. Well, he was actually traveling, excuse me, with his tribe when they were ambushed by the Grovant in 1832. 
this is of interest to us, of course, because it has a, a crane head affixed to it. And there are some feathers of what I do not know. We could probably find out if we submitted those to the Fish and Wildlife Service Forensic Laboratory over in Oregon, but I would not hold my breath waiting for a reply because uh, they have an awful lot of work. They're really, really, really booked up. Now here's a very common bird, a uh, red-winged blackbird. A, a pecuni or pygon or blackfoot, whatever term you want to call them, they preferred pecuni among themselves. Uh, a pecuni uh, medicine man, a, a leader, who had the authority, tribal authority, to wear one of those on himself, did so if he had power over the weather. We could use somebody like that here in Arizona. Another bird that shows up commonly in archaeological sites is the California woodpecker. Of course, they occur here in, in uh, this part of Arizona. Uh, this, by the way, is a female, as indicated by the fact that it has a black forehead in the male, the, the red crown extends all the way to the front of the forehead. So there would be more red there and the females have a black forehead. Anyway, these are, uh, were, I should say, utilized by the California tribes uh, as a means of exchange. Think of them as money, uh, a California woodpecker skin and scalp could be uh, traded for something else. Uh, there is a hoopa headdress in the Chicago Museum of Natural History that has the, the scalps and beaks of 102 California woodpeckers thrown together. Uh, a very jazzy looking headdress, in my opinion. And there's another hoopa headdress that has the, the just the chin, these very purple chin skins of Anna's hummingbird, 58 of those sewn on a white deerskin headband. Talk about delicate work needed to skin a bird. Hummingbirds have incredibly thin skin. So to get those off and, and tanned and put on a headband, quite a, a feat of dexterity. This is an artist's representation of what Nokai de Clenny may have looked like. He was a white mountain Apache who fomented the outbreak at CBQ in August of 1881. And he's of interest to us because he has uh, turkey feathers. And again, that's more white than bronze. So this is from a turkey that... Uh, has uh, the white jeans in its pool. And the other thing of importance is these, we know that these were owl feathers, but they are painted yellow. And so the point is you cannot always positively identify a feather from an artist's representation by its color, because we know that they were dyed or painted. Here again, you, you need to look into the literature or have access to DNA to be able to identify them positively. Okay, getting back to uh, war uh, trophy representations, you remember that the red spot indicated that this chap, Mato Tope, the forebears, had uh, killed enemies, and uh, this indicated that he had cut a throat, and uh, this indicated that he personally had been wounded many times. This little wooden knife indicates that he had taken a knife from an enemy and killed the individual with it. And here again, we have some owl feathers that are painted or dyed yellow. That's not a normal color for them. Alas, we do not know the significance of having changed the color of the owl feathers. Mato Tope was uh, uh, second chief amongst the uh, Mandan, a very great friend of the whites, he said, 
He had been a great friend of the whites until 1838 when uh, he contracted smallpox and died as a result of it. Very nice examples of pomo basketry and uh, notice these feathers in this one. And a, a pomo woman was obligated to weave into a basket the uh, shaft of a, of a red shafted flicker if she happened to enter her menstrual period before she got the basket done. So this is a red shafted flicker, a male as indicated by the bright red mustaches that it has. The red shafted flicker appears in more archeological sites throughout the plains than any other individual species of bird. And finally, all of us who are interested in ornithology owe a great debt of gratitude to John James Audubon for the terrific work that he did in uh, collecting and, and painting and observing the habits and habitat of avifauna. Well, I'm gonna turn it back over to Richard now to see if anybody has a question or a comment. Okay, you're done with the PowerPoint? I am done. Well, then I'll stop. Uh, and I'll stop sharing. That, <laughs> Bless you. Yeah, that's, that's why fine. you get the big money. <laughs> I just very much I enjoyed it. Yes, that was me? very good. You're uh, very kind. Yeah, we're trying me? something new here. We're doing a Zoom meeting with uh, both Miles and myself together in the same room. I hope it turned out good. I think it did. Well, I felt secure having you here in case the screen went dark. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we have anybody else that would like to comment? Uh, you can all turn your uh, video and uh, sound on if you would like to ask questions. Well, I'd like I, to... I have one question. Uh, <clears throat> is there any explanation for why the flicker was so commonly used or found at least? I do not know, because not every tribe had the same cultural milieu, but certainly it's a very beautiful, very colorful bird. Okay. It's just the most commonly found species amongst archaeological sites. Yeah. Well, what is the range of the bird? Sir? What the is range. the range for it? The range? Where do you find yes. It? Oh, well, okay. This is the red shafted flicker, so we find them pretty much west of the 100th meridian and the yellow shafted flicker pretty much east of the 100th meridian. They're, they're, they're an Eastern bird. The red shafted is a, a Western variety. Thanks for the question. So which one was it? Which one was it that was the most commonly found? The red shafted flicker, the last bird that I showed. Okay. Calaptes, Calaptes kafer is its Latin name. Kafer referring to the color. Calaptes kafer. I have a couple of, couple of comments. I know something about the Cheyenne. The Cheyenne supposedly, their arrows were recognized by the fact that they used turkey wing feathers yeah. to their shafts. Mm -hmm. And another thing about the Cheyennes was that they liked to use sandhill crane bones for their war whistles. Yeah. Probably they used it for the Sundance too, but I know they used it for their war whistles, and I wonder why. Was it because their head of the crane was red? They considered the crane a brave animal, or right. what? Uh, another final thought was that I read somewhere that the Native Americans, when they caught a javelina, as we all know, they've got a scent gland on their back that smells awful. But they yeah. caught a javelina, and they would take a quill or perhaps a small reed and insert it into the opening of that gland and let all the smell blow out before uh -huh. they the javelina. Uh -huh. now, of course, you've got to still be real careful because it smells all over the javelina fur also. Uh -huh. You don't want to let that touch the meat. But that's a couple little tidbits about birds. Mm -hmm. the, the Pima Papago utilized the, the feathers of a buzzard 
uh, to uh, put on their their arrows. A comment on the on the Cheyenne. They call themselves just this thought, which means the people. They got called the Cheyenne again by the French traders who, when they got out amongst the, the Nata Sioux, the, the Sioux, the Lakota, they asked them, who are those people that live on the prairie to the west of you? And uh, because they did not speak a, a Siouxan language, but spoke a, a different, actually a Udo-Aztecan language, talking about the Cheyenne now, the Lakota said, just uh, um, Shahiana. They called them Shahiana, which meant red talkers or, or foreign speakers rather than than uh, speaking our language. So there, there's just testosterone amongst themselves rather than Cheyenne. Good fun. Thanks for sharing that information on the Cheyenne fletching. Did you get that from George Bird Grinnell or, or some other source? I don't know. I remember, you know, looking up uh, what they used on their feathers and things. I've got a good friend on the Cheyenne Reservation. Oh. And somewhere yeah. I ran across the fact that they were well known for using turkey, the barred mm -hmm. turkey feathers, on mm -hmm. their arrows. Therefore, mm -hmm. you can recognize mm -hmm. the arrows of at least the northern Cheyenne, but I would think mm -hmm. it more likely the southern Cheyenne. But the, they, that's what they're supposedly used to fletch their arrows. Mm -hmm. When Am Dr. I unmuted Ellie right now? Am I unmuted? We can hear you, Maxine. Hey, I'd like to thank you so much for your talk. It was so good. I always enjoy you. Thank you very much. You're very kind. <laughs> uh, is TJ McMichael out there? TJ, speak up if you're with us. Yeah, this looks like he's still... I've got a question for Miles. Go ahead. You know a whole lot about the buffalo hunters and the buffalo. What about the birds that were associated with the Indian buffalo hunters or the hunters that were associated with the buffalo hunting? Any well, birds to relate to that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one that comes to mind was Plenty Coup, a chief of the Crow, leader of the Crow Indians, certainly buffalo hunting Indians. And uh, his personal war medicine was a chickadee, not some big uh, golden eagle or something like that. So uh, these are uh, such individual things. But no, I, I cannot come up with any birds associated with Native American buffalo hunters. <laughs> One of many areas of my ignorance. How, oh, how you might. I was going to mention Dr. Elliot Cows, not coos or cooies, as most of the uh, redneck deer hunters call them. The man pronounced his name Cows, as in wait till the cows come home. There's an article verifying that in the current uh, Arizona Wildlife Views. Anyway, because he was a medical doctor over at uh, Fort, oh, the one over at Prescott, what's the name of that? Anyway, he was when when he was assigned there, he had to remove arrows, Apache arrows, uh, and he reported that if if a soldier caught two or more arrows, he was not going to survive. Didn't hardly matter where they went. If he got more than two arrows, they were going to kill him. But uh, uh, he, he commented that the Apache arrowheads were white chert, and they tended to splinter or fragment, of course, when they hit a bone, and uh, septicemia would, would set in. The guy just didn't have much chance of surviving if they were hit. He also reported that the Apaches deliberately poisoned their arrows by uh, leaving them set in putrefying uh, deer liver, that sort of thing. So, pays your money, takes your chances about what really killed a soldier. Was it <laughs> poison or bloodletting. I'm really curious to know if uh, T.J. McMichael is out there. T.J., please speak up. T.J. is another guy that uh, Agave House ought to get to, to be an invited speaker. Well, I'll have to get in touch with him. You'll have to give me his information. I'll, I'll be glad to. Here's, here's Dr. Kaimaloa Christman. Uh, right here, you ought to get him to come and talk. 
he knows something about everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds I'll like take that compliment any day. <laughs> TJ gives a very good presentation on, uh, oh dear, now I've lost the name of it, but he does a, an impersonation of Aldo Leopold, which is a wonderful presentation if you can get him. It's nice to see you. I think almost the last time we met was uh, when we were dealing with that horrible atrocity over <laughs> at the Pueblo there in Eager. Yes, we, I remember meeting you there. That was not a, not a it, fun day, was it? <laughs> it was Susan who brought to my attention that there were human bones virtually on the surface that had been driven over, plowed up. Bad news all the way around. Yep. Miles, I had one question about um, uh, Mato Tape. On his headdress, you, there was a, uh, a knife in there. What did you say that that indicated? The, uh, the knife indicated that he had taken a knife away from an enemy and killed that person with it. Oh, okay. There's a wonderful book titled, um, yeah, come on, Miles. Anyway, it's by uh, Thomas and Ron and Felt. And I don't care who that is. I'm going to turn it off. Thank you. Um, the book is titled The People of the First Man by Thomas and Ronenfeld, and they will tell you more than you want to know about the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Blackfeet. It's just simply a wonderful book. It's okay. illustrated by Carl Bodmer, who accompanied Prince Maximilian von Vide Nuvid when he went up the river in 1833, all the way from St. Louis to uh, Fort Clark. Uh, no, it went past that. They went to Fort Union on the boundary of Montana and North Dakota. Just a, a fabulous book. Well, see if People I can of find the First it. Man. I'm sorry? I said, I'll see if I can find it. You can ask your library to get an interlibrary loan. Uh, a copy available for sale is very pricey. Oh, okay. Or... I'll loan you mine. <laughs> Next time you're in Sholo, look me up and I'll loan you mine. Okay. How's that for a good deal? That sounds great. Okay. Well, are there any more questions? Uh, yes, comments? I have a question for Miles. Oh. <laughs> question yes, for Miles. Yes, sir. Uh, well, at the University of Kansas, so we're a little off subject here, but did you happen to run into my cousin, Dick Eversole? No, not that I recall, but my memory is not perfect anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just wondered. Yeah. He's a professor there and was for a very long time. A professor of what? Uh, gosh, you got me on that. He was a little older yeah. than me. I was closer to his younger brother. Yeah. Well, I'm 79. I was at the University of Kansas from 61 till 68. I, actually, I was not on campus all that time. So. Okay, yeah, that would. Uh, Dick didn't move to Kansas until oh. the mm -hmm. late '70s. So, okay, oh. yeah. Let you get back to the subject. Well, it's nice <laughs> to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. I'm I'm known as Debbie's husband, Bob. Oh, okay. <laughs> My claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anybody else? Well, if there's no other questions, I want to thank uh, Miles for being our speaker and uh, thank everybody for joining us. And with that, I'll go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you, thank you Miles. Bless. God thank bless you. and Godspeed. Amen. So, Darling was thank on you, all these other people. Yes. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Miles. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you back. Yes. <laughs> Good to be seen at my age. <laughs> all right. Well, good evening, all. Bye. Oh, bye. 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 bye.